I've concocted this little stylized map of the river. Um, basically, there's two branches at the top end of it. One of them starts in Carshalton and the other starts or started historically in Croydon. You can't see the river now above Wadden Ponds, a bit downstream of Croydon. And in very wet years when the bourne was up, it rose in the valleys behind Croydon uh, and possibly behind Carshalton, but that's not relevant to what we're doing tonight. The Croydon branch sort of flows westwards, meets the Carshalton branch at Hackbridge, and then it kind of wanders northwards until you get to the River Thames. Um, it's got quite a drop on it, about 100 feet over its length from uh, Carshalton and Beddington down to the uh, Thames itself. And has long had a reputation for being a river full of mills. And I just want to explore that a bit. Um, Why has that done that on me? Ah, that's better. Um, the this is the Arundel map of Carshalton, so it's the Carshalton branch of the river, uh, sort of running down here, and this is the Croydon branch coming down on the right. For those of you who know Carshalton, the ponds are here uh, near the bottom. That's Carshalton Church. Uh, that lake um, has moved a bit. Um, and is, its success is now in the grounds of St Philomena's school. Uh, you can see if you look carefully, you've got three water mills here. We've got upper mill, middle mill and lower mill. Lower mill sort of straddles uh, the two arms of the river. I don't know exactly how that worked out because that image is all the information we've got basically. Um, and you've got this strip of land, which was called the Hack. And this is Hack Bridge just at the top there. And we're looking about 1620. And um, moving further down, this is Hack Bridge again, and that's Lower Mill that I was looking at a moment ago. And you can see this river shows a river pretty well down to Mitcham Bridge. So the We've got most of the upper part of the river there, and there is not a single mill between Lower Mill and the mill just above Mit Mitcham Bridge. It's really a very rural river. Most of the river mills are flour mills at that date, and it's industry that's really pretty much connected to the local economy. Um, Come a hundred years later, this Sellers map of Surrey, 1693, as you can see, um, the planning of the river is somewhat bizarre. I don't know quite how he arrived at this network of channels, but what is immediately striking is that we've got, as we look along the river, iron mill, copper mill, um, I'm not quite certain what that is, and then you've got a powder mill, a skinning mill, a whole load of new industry has appeared on the river, really in about pretty much 50 or 60 years between the sort of the middle two quarters of the 17th century, the middle half of the 17th century. And if you move on a bit and look at Seno's map, which is into the early 18th century, 1729, you can see that the industries have become well established up in Carshalton at this point. Middle mill that we were looking at to become a copper mill. Lower mill we were looking at to becoming a copper mill. The skinning mills that was on that section of the river that had no mills on it at all. And the same applies to the budge mill. Mitcham mills older and you can go following down. You've got a Wimbledon copper mill there. You've got an iron mill. Basically, the river has become industrialised really rather rapidly when you think about it. Um, and very roughly, because a knowledge of the um, early industries on the river, um, and ideal as you'll see almost totally in the upper part of the river, is a bit restricted. But just looking at some of the industries you've got, we've got Upper Mill in Carshalton, which was a flour mill when um, Arundel map was made. 
And um, it's probably, in fact, the site of the Doomsday Book Mill in Carshall, no, we can't be quite certain about that. It, it stayed as a flour mill, it always was. Middle Mill had been a flour mill. By 1706, it's a copper mill. Uh, lower Mill, the one that straddles the river junction, now that is the one mill in the group that had had a long history in non-flour milling. I don't know why. Um, in the late 13th century, it was Fulling Mill. In the 16th century, it had a period as a Brazil mill, and it became a gunpowder and a copper mill. We'll explore both of those a bit more later. Um, Culver's, again, moving downstream, from 1732 was a bleach ground. We'll have a look at that uh, in a bit more detail. And then you've got the leather mills, <coughs> dye mill, and uh, a budge mill for processing skins that have still got their fur on them, and a logwood mill, all really connected with the leather or textile trades. Uh, logwood was being ground up as dye stuff, basically. <clears throat> and then on the Croydon branch, we've got um, a Bandon or Beddington Mill, which in the early 17th, early 18th century was still a flour mill, just wouldn't be a lot longer, and Wadden Bill, which was a flour mill. So by 1700, you've got a huge variety of industry on the upper part of the river, sort of above Mitcham, and it's not any different further downstream, but I'm going to concentrate on the upper river because I know it best. Now, I'm going to look at a couple of mill sites, and I'm going to start with Lower Mill, the one that had a long history of... Um, not being a flour mill, and the one that straddles the two branches of the Wandle. And um, just kind of bear in mind that, the, the way the rivers come together and the, the long spit, the hack. Um, in the Middle Ages, it had been a fulling mill. This is Reese's Cyclopedia, I think, which is an early 19th century book, and it shows fulling stocks. I rather fancy the um, medieval ones might have looked a bit more ro ropey than this. But basically what fulling was, was beating woolen cloth in fuller's earth and water uh, to clean it and to shrink it. It was done after it had been woven and was designed to mat the cloth and bring it to bring it into more dense cloth and also to clean the grease out of it and so you've got this cog wheel that would have been driven by uh, the water wheel and you can see you've got sort of cans coming off the shaft and they lifted these big heavy woolen wooden mallets and um, it's a bit of an oddity actually because um, we know that sheep was were reared on the downs and the downs locally had a good reputation for producing fine wool um, but there's no real record of a textile making industry in, in east this part of east surrey as far as i know there is in west surrey in the middle ages kind of think we might be missing something there anyhow a fulling mill was built and in fact it belonged to merton priory coming on a bit and this is the same mill and an early 19th century map. And hasn't the river been altered massively? This is the Croydon branch of the river coming down to the junction. This is the hack here. Um, and following the original channel, you can see the, the land boundary picks that out, that dotted line. This is the Carl Shelton River. And you, there's quite a considerable dam if you walk along the banks here today you'll notice quite considerable dam. That channel in fact was banked up all the way up here for reasons I'll show you in a minute uh, to raise the maximum amount of water here. Now this arrangement, the map's early 19th century but I think this arrangement almost certainly dates back to the middle of the 17th century. So fairly significant bit of engineering work for the period. And notice how you've got probably two water wheels there. That could well uh, be connected with a water wheel. That could well be connected with a water wheel. And in fact, the mill was rebuilt as a gunpowder mill. And if you've got a gunpowder mill, 
you really need dispersed buildings because of course it's quite easy to have serious accidents with gunpowder um, and <clears throat> hence the the multiple water wheels and the scattered buildings and the relatively elaborate dam I think uh, the pools in the middle were fish ponds but of course they would have also served as a mill pond assuming they were open to the channel and um, this was an osier bed that is willow that was cut uh, to get a material for making baskets common waddle side industry now returning to this area here and i said this channel was banked up and that is the reason why i know it is banked up which is not all that obvious really um it makes a bit you've got the railway embankment there look and it makes a bit more sense if you look at victorian map this is where that this photo is taken i think looking across there and you can see that this whole area of meadow has been flooded and allowed to freeze so that people can skate on it this is about early 20th century i don't know the exact date um and that to be able to do that and flood it this is the river bank here it means quite clearly that that meadow is below river level and therefore that the river channel has been banked all the way up to get that extra power for the mill um, and um, there is some evidence pretty tentative evidence in fact that the meadow was originally drained through a culvert laid under the river into a channel that runs around here uh, latterly it, the water was pumped off it using this water wheel which was located there so you've got really quite a complex bit of engineering work uh, done on the river to as part of the process of industrialization in the probably the mid 17th century and uh, returning to that as i said uh, there's a there's a whole related series of changes relating to the creation of the mill and the ponds and the management of that meadow now gunpowder making um don't be deceived by these prints. This is Diderot's Encyclopedia French and 18th century. And he always gives you the impression that industrial processes were carried out in very grand and spacious buildings. Uh, I think we would find the mills there cramped, scruffy, and um, pretty dirty, basically. And the fundamental steps of making gunpowder was to take a mixture of sulfur, saltpeter and charcoal and grind it down into a fine powder. And here, this is being done with drop hammers. So you've got the water wheel be behind the wall there, um, lifting these, these drop hammers through a series of cams and they fall down onto the powder and crush it. You can imagine the amount of dust that would throw up. It would be absolutely appalling in there I imagine and also uh, the slightest spark and you've got an explosion on your hands you know you do not wear um, shoes boots with metal studs in them for instance uh, iron studs might strike a, a spark and that would be fatal um, explosions accidents in powder mills I don't know of one on this site but they weren't uncommon Later, the drop hammers were replaced by edge runner mills. These are like giant wheels that are rotated, roll round and round, driven by the cogs, uh, which are obviously connected to a water wheel behind the wall. Uh, we'll find these edge runner mills used in a whole series of industrial processes of one sort and another. Um, I suppose they were more efficient. They certainly weren't any less dangerous. I don't think so anyhow. When the powder had been ground, it was corned, and um, this involved basically pressing it into sheets, then breaking it up and sieving it so that the grains of gunpowder were a consistent size, which controls how fast the powder burns when it's fired. Again, I just imagine this space full of explosive dust, lethal sorts, dangerous place um 
the guy who ran the powder mills uh, was a guy called Josias Dewey. Um, the house he lived in um, has long been demolished, but he did build this as a speculative investment. I think it's Strawberry Lodge in Mill Lane. Um, take off the Victorian Bay windows and you've got the sort of late late 17th century house that, as I say, I think he probably built as a speculative investment, but it's really the last memorial, visible memorial to him in Cochon. Um, around the end of the 17th century, that mill ceased to be used for gunpowder and was turned into a copper mill. There was a great outbreak of copper milling on the Wandle in the um, 18th, early, late, very late 17th, early 18th century. Um, what they're doing, they're not smelting ores to make copper, they're taking copper ingots and beating them down to make hollow pots and pans of one sort and another, cooking pots and frying pans and things like that. Um, and it was done by shaping the pot under trip hammers. So you've got the water wheel again behind the wall and you've got the shaft with the cams on it and it causes the hammer to lift and drop probably quite quickly. And a guy will sit there uh, literally working the object under the hammer as he is there and there. Um, when you hit copper with a hammer long ago, I learned it in school metal work, it eventually goes hard and you have to anneal it, you have to heat it up and cool it and then it becomes soft almost like cardboard and you can work it again. So you've got this process of annealing and hammering and kneeling and hammering and they're turning out basically hollow wares which I imagine for the most part are taken and sold in London. We've moved downstream now. The mill at the River Junction is just up here, and this is Hackbridge here. Um, and we've got another major Wandle site industry of the late 17th and 18th century, which is textile bleaching. There are basically two fabrics involved. One of them um, was cotton cloth, which was early on at least, largely imported from India. And the other one, which was what they were working on here at the um, Shetley at the Culver's site, um, was a Russian canvas. And the way of bleaching it before ke modern chemical bleaches were introduced is you took the cloth, you boiled it up uh, in a mixed a solution of wood ash, basically, and then laid it out on the field to bleach in the sun. And apparently it bleached more quickly if you kept it damp. So you have these fields with little water channels running across them, which um, the guys can use uh, to wet the cloth down. Um, and once you'd put it out in the sun for a while, the whole process was repeated. It would be taken, put in a wash mill and washed. It would then be boiled up in the wood ash again and then out on the field it would go again. If you were doing thinner cloth like cotton, possibly you'd do that half a dozen times, maybe a dozen or more for heavy canvas. Um, so you needed a wash mill and that was driven by water. It was like a big water filled tub, pretty much like a giant version of a modern washing machine, except that the water in it wasn't heated and instead of being turned by an electric motor, it was turned by a water wheel. Um, and this is where the wash mill uh, building was. And typical of the Wandel, there was also a flour mill there. It's so common to get two or three mills driven by the same dam on the Wandel. Um, and this is the owner's house um, so uh, he could sit there and look down on his business. Very common for early modern industrialists to sit uh, to live on top of the business. Um, this is a painting, I think it's in the Art Museum in Brussels, but the scene is in the Netherlands. Uh, that in fact is Harlem Church, that great building in the background. You're sort of standing on the 
edge of the sand dunes along the North Sea, I think, looking across towards Harlem. And we have a bleached ground look, and you can see the cloth laid out on the grass. And various people sort of um, working on it, putting it out, I think, and he's taking it over across the field. And I think this guy is flicking water out of the channel over the cloth. I can't think what else he's doing. Um, so that gives some sense of what it looked like. And there was acres of ground along the Wandle in the second half of the 18th century that was devoted to textile bleaching. When chemical bleaches were introduced in the early 19th century, they were so much quicker that the industry went into a very rapid decline. Um, and I said we got here, this is where the wash mill would have been, and also the flour mill. And um, the, the wash mill went with the bleach ground early in the 19th century, probably not all that long after this map was made in 1806. But the flour mill continued. In fact, I think it was probably rebuilt. That's a 19th century building, I think. Uh, and that survived down till after the Second World War when it was demolished, apart from the wheel pit. It's one of the, there's not many water wheel pits left along the Wandle, and this is one of them. Undershot wheel with a sloping um, sluice gate, sort of possibly first half of the 19th century kind of date, although people have put concrete on it later. Um, Textile bleaching had a companion industry, and that was calico pr printing, which was basically printing cotton cloth. Um, very tricky process, so I won't go to it in detail, but basically you stuck the cloth on a table with starch paste and then printed the design using wooden blocks uh, covered with ink. And for every color, you needed a different block and they had to register exactly. One of those things that's easy to describe and I strongly suspect fantastically difficult to do well. Um, and you would also need to, at intervals, wash the cloth out so you've got a drying ground. We don't know that this print works out of wash mill, though the way the channel runs to it and from it makes it look rather likely. So um, there's a lot of these small forgotten mill sites along the Wandle, certainly along the upper river, and I imagine uh, lower down as well. Um, moving downstream again and to another industry, we've got here, this is uh, Mill Green at Hackbridge, uh, it's still an open green. Uh, this is the Goat Road Bridge, which I always just call Goat. And um, you can see you've got a group of mills here. There's Mitcham Leather Mills, Flour Mill and Drug and Dye Mill. There's the Wandle Tannery here. And at the top here, we've got the another um, milling operation, the Eagle Leather Works um, and Rabbit Warren of sort of channels and side channels and this and that. The leather industry was big on the Wandle and it had certainly, there's a budge mill marked on that 17th century map. It's certainly one of the industries that gets established in the 17th century. There's two faces to it. One of them is the tan tanning sort of operation. Uh, this basically involved soaking hides in pits that were filled with uh, oak bark to tan the cloth. It might have involved a bit of washing, but essentially it's not it's a, not a milling process. And although you needed water, you didn't need that much water. It was wonderfully good for polluting the river, though, with the effluent from it. And the other one, which was much more a water powered industry, involved things like goat and um, sheep skins. And these weren't tanned and they were often processed and finished uh, using oil, linseed oil and things like that. And that is probably what Mitchum leather mills are up to and the Eagle Leather Works 
was up to, but it's this site that had earlier been the budge mill. Um, and so there was oh, two or three other tan yards and leather works on the upper river. It's really quite a major industry. Um, and this sort of scene must once have been so common. I'm not quite convinced. This is said to be the league the Eagle Leather Works. Maybe it quite possibly is, but I'm not absolutely confident about it. But you can see that the skins have been put out in the field to dry. And it must have been just so common. If you went down the river in the 18th and 19th century to see uh, acres of ground uh, devoted to drying uh, cloth and uh, leather and to bleaching. The buildings, usually pretty scrubby to be rude about it. This is the Eagle Leather Works. Absolutely typical Wandel industrial buildings made cheaply of timber with a pan tile roof. Occasionally they'd run to using brick uh, and the slate roofing probably not until the railways came. Um, so, and just slightly upstream, uh, moving up, upstream of Goat Bridge. These buildings have gone now, but this was the McRae's works, which was quite a major leather works right through from at least the early 18th century into the, well into the 19th century. And there's a bit of them still there. I'm not really certain how much of that building has come down from the leather works. Either way around, the site's up for redevelopment, so it won't be there a lot longer. Um, I said that the leather, the sheep skins and goat skins were often processed using oil. And in fact, there was at least one oil mill on the river, which was at the Shepley mill site, the gunpowder and copper mill site, that became a leather works and the oil mill was installed there. And um, there's two steps or fundamental steps. One of them is to put the linseed under these massive edge runner mills, wheels, that roll around and crush it. It was then put in this contraption um, and these, these things drove down wedges which squeezed the seed which was in the bag down here and the oil flowed out basically um, and was then used in the um, adjacent uh, leather works. What is interesting about this is that at the top it says that it's designed by John Smeaton and we know that the text makes it quite clear that this relates to the oil mill at the leather works at the river junction that we were talking about. Now Smeaton is one of the really great engineers of the early industrial revolution. He, he designed the Forth and Clyde Canal, he designed Ramsgate Harbour or extensions to, um, he designed windmills, um, he designed at least one steam engine, uh, he designed a drainage system on the North Pennines for the London Lead Company and he worked on water mills and he carried out quite a lot of experiments to improve the efficiency of water wheels and was quite successful. Um, in his career, he's known to have done 35 mills. Five of those mills were on the Wandle. And it just goes to show that the river was really under quite a lot of pressure. There was a shortage of power, basically. And the mill owners are willing to pay, I believe at one point he charged a guinea a day for his services, a lot of money in the 18th century. Um, they were willing to pay for a top designer uh, to uh, get the very best out of the water on the Wandle. That building, which has gone now, I think is probably Smeaton's Mill building, though I can't prove it. Um, it. This is towards the end of its life when it had been converted into a snuff mill, of which more later, in fact, become derelict by the look of it. It's in a terrible state. Um, but of those five mills, there are only, there's visible remains of only one, and that one is up a mill in Carsholton, 
And these wheel pits at the bottom, these are Smeaton's designs. The Royal Society have still got the drawings for them. This building's a lot later, it's 1880s and was built as a private electricity generating plant. But on the downstream side, absolutely typical Wandle Mill layout actually with the two wheels in the river channel and the spillway between them. This is the um, uh, generating plant. But all this Portland stonework was the wheel pits of a big brick flour mill that straddled the river and was designed by Smeaton in the 1770s. Um, so it's actually quite an important um, thing because there's very little of Smeaton's mill work left, I think. Certainly, as far as I know, it's the only bit surviving on the Wandle. Um, I've looked at some of the earlier industries on the river. I'm going to look at a couple that came later. One of them was grinding tobacco down to make snuff. I get the impression snuff didn't really become fashionable until fairly well into the 18th century. There then seems to have been a bit of a craze for it and snuff grinding became quite an important uh, Wandle site industry from around the end of the 18th century. And this is the mill at Beddington. Um, this is the miller's house on the right. And this slummy looking building, it's photographed probably about 1860, is the mill, mill building itself. So it's not very big. It's about twice as long. You'll see about half of the mill building. And um, equally another rather small and scruffy operation. This is Butterhill Bridge in Carshalton. You've got Mill Lane on the right. And this is a snuff mill. That is a flour mill. Again, typical wandle. We've got uh, three water wheels around a single dam. And um, that is the back of it. That's the, this, this bit of the snuff mill. The flour mill's out of sight on the right. And uh, you can see you've got a couple of water wheels with it, in fact, the usual spillway in the middle. Um, and the process of snuff grinding, we're back at Hackbridge, in fact, where the Smeaton oil mill was. Uh, that was converted into a snuff mill. And these photos were taken inside there in the early 20th century. So the first thing you do is dry the tobacco to make as brittle as possible. And then you crush it under edge runner mills, um, another use for edge runner mills. And well, it seems if it's spread over the floor, you just swept it back with a broom. Um, I've no doubt the dirt off the floor added a certain something to the taste of it or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> it always seems a bit dubious to me. Having done that first rough grinding, it went in these mortars and pestles and was ground to very fine powder. Uh, this, of course, is 19th century machinery with all this cast iron. Uh, the 18th century, all the cogs would have been wooden. Um, and as I say, quite an important wonderful side industry for a few decades across the late 18th and the first half of the 19th century. The other industry that became important on the Wandle is paper. This appears in the 18th century, although paper mills existed in Britain back into the 16th century. They're not, I'm aware of, on the Wandle. Um, you could make pa papers made of rags that's beaten down to make a pulp. And um, the original way was with drop hammers, like, um, like those used for making gunpowder. But this is uh, another bit of kit that was invented in the 18th century. It's called a Hollander. And the water wheels drove this sort of cylindrical thing, it stood in a tank of water with the rags in it. And th this thing beat the rags to pulp and they sort of were pushed out and flowed round and round uh, and again and again through the beating thing. Um, this is from um, Diderot again and gives far too grand sense of what the thing would have really looked like. I think you're thinking something much more like this. 
Uh, this is a paper mill at Amalfi in Italy, and you've got this tiny little Hollander that's a beating cylinder in a very small and quite scruffy place. And I imagine the Wandle mills were much more like that than the um, Diderot illustrations. Um, there's a basket of rags there just to, um, it's run as a museum now, very good little museum. Um, having got the pulp, uh, you put it in a tub, you took a tray that had got a fine wire mesh in it, inserted the tray, this is the tray here, in the, in the slurry of um, beaten up um, cotton or linen, and then just lifted it out and a sheet of paper formed on the wire mesh. And then, of course, you had to press it out and dry it out and they would be sorted and graded and sized. But that was paper making. Um, and there were two or three mills on the upper river that were making paper from roughly the middle of the 18th century, well into the 19th century. Um, so we've seen that the river got industrialized really quite dramatically in the first half of the um, in the first half of the, or in the middle of the 17th century, so that by the time you get to the end of the 17th century, uh, the river's quite industrialized. And uh, as you go on into the 18th century more so, and the water becomes very pressurized, the demand for power basically, and you've got people like Smeaton working to improve the mills and other, quite elaborate bits of engineering like the similar to the work done at the river junction uh, for the powder mill. Well I thought about this some while ago and I thought the rivers really got industrialized in the 17th century but when you think about it the industrial revolution in England is generally thought of as starting in the 18th century and there's exceptions to that but there's quite a lot of truth in that. And I thought, did the industrial movement in England actually start on the rivers like the Wandle around London? And of course, London is the core of this. You've got this huge market and also a massive trading centre. Um, in the middle of the 16th century, London was sort of B-list European capital city to be rude about it. Um, by the end of the 17th century, it has become uh, one of the most important cities in Europe, in fact, and also obviously the administrative center of a pretty rapidly growing empire with trade connections running all over the place. And the city had expanded enormously uh, and obviously provided a large market, uh, quite apart from what was sold beyond London, um, into wider England and wider Europe for that matter. The, and I thought, yes, that must be, it was the market that drove the industrialization of the river and it must have been a leading sort of thing in the development of industry. Then I had a shock. This is Rothenburg in Germany. It's on the far side of the Rhine, uh, the, north side of Rhine Rift, east side of Rhine Rift. Um, lovely little town, spent a weekend there, a long weekend there, uh, and it's definitely worth a long weekend, a very interesting place. Um, and the town's on a hill and there's a deep valley and down the bottom you can see buildings and some of those buildings are water mills. Um, so obviously I was quite curious and wandered down there. And the um, the locals are obviously interested in them and uh, have got these interpretation signs explaining their history and things. Unfortunately, I was with friends and somebody could read enough German to tell me what the sign said, as my German's useless. Um, and uh, I was astonished. This You've got these dense mills, just like the Wandle, but that didn't happen in the 18th century or in the 17th century. It happened in the 15th and 16th century. Um, and uh, all of a sudden I realized that London 
was basically the wandel in the 17th century isn't revolutionary, it's playing catch up. Um, I think this is even more striking when you think about this place where we all know where this is, isn't it? It's Florence. And, you know, we all know about Florence, about art and the Renaissance and the Medici and all that sort of stuff. Um, however, if you read about the textile industry, wool textile industry, in the late Middle Ages, an awful lot of English wool and cloth went to Florence, was exported to Florence for finishing, and they had the skills to uh, dye it in better ways than could be done in England and turn it into a much more valuable product. Um, and the Medici bankers, okay, they got very rich, ultimately, I suppose, as the bankers to the papacy, but I guess they got started financing industry around that sort of area. And some few years ago, I went from Florence to um, Bologna by train, and uh, the train toddles along from Florence, which is down, down here, down the bottom here, gets to Prato, and then, well, it doesn't now, but in the past, it turned up and went up this valley through the Apennines. There's now a long tunnel. It's very boring. Um, and up this valley, there was mill after mill after mill. And I remember thinking, OK, they look like they're 19th century buildings now. But I had a sneaking suspicion if we went up that valley in the late 15th, early 16th century, we'd find a whole load of textile and other mills. In other words, the river was already industrialised. The annoying thing about this is, of course, that the Italians don't seem to give a have any interest at all in their industrial history. I uh, suppose they've got too much art and too much classical stuff. Uh, but it seems to me actually quite a key area for the late medieval development of uh, industry in Europe. And in fact, you can go to that ultimate tourist trap of Venice. And we're not looking at water mills, but we're looking at significant industrialization. Venetian glass was famous in the 15th century as it is now, and North Italy um, was in European terms an early producer of tin glaze pottery, uh, which came, of course, from the Middle East originally. Um, so when we get to that map of the Wandel, far from being radical in the wider world, it is really a catch-up exercise. London is becoming bigger, its markets expanding on a massive scale, um, and the river's getting industrialised, but it's really not going anywhere that various parts of some parts of Western Europe, by no means all, uh, hadn't already been. So what then is the thing, the revolutionary thing? And I think really in the end, an awful lot of it rotates around this monstrosity. Um, and this is the Thomas, it says Captain Savory and Mr. Newcomen, but the real designer of this is Thomas Newcomen. And it's a Dudley Castle steam engine. And as you can see, it was erected in 1712 and it was for pumping water out of coal mines monstrously inefficient device, but the mine owners didn't care because if you're running a coal mine, you get loads of small broken coal and they just didn't care how much fuel it burnt. It was just irrelevant. Um, so it, the steam engine at first is basically just a drainage engine. But of course, people like James Watt improve it massively. They put a separate condenser on it and eventually in the early 19th century, people develop high, high pressure steam engines and you can start putting them on wheels. And this is the, um, this is probably Puffin Billy, I think on the, certainly on the Wylam Colliery Railway, uh, 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 which took coal down to the Tyne basically. 
Uh, and there's two implications there. The railways allow coal and goods and all kinds of things to be moved about all over the place relatively easily. And the second thing, of course, is that once you've got efficient steam engines, you're not dependent on water. You don't need water power to the same extent. And returning to the Wandle, some of the mills did install steam engines. This is in the Grove Mill at Carsholton, not to be confused with the mill in Grove Park at Carsholton. That's a different mill. And you've got this grasshopper high pressure steam engine, um, which was put in the mill at some point in the 19th century. The mill itself, this is the mill, was built in the 1780s, snuff mill, typical Wandle, cheaply built weatherboard mill, pamp tile roof, and unusual for the Wandle, big over, overshot water wheel driven by a feeder from Carsholton Park. So various mills, this and others, get steam engines, but of course it's really kind of a rear guard action. And you do get, this is Beddington Mill as rebuilt in the 1880s here, looks like it should have a steam engine. I'm not certain it did. The water, it was driven laterally by two water turbines, which are more efficient than water wheels. And this, this whole load of outbuildings is a bakery, in fact. So it's grinding the flour and um, baking it and retailing the stuff from one operation. And you do get big industrial mills. This is at um, Wadden, just below Croydon. And you've got here definitely steam engines you can see the big chimneys for the boilers and of course it's got a railway siding which ran down from the um wimbledon to west croydon railway now the tram link in fact and you can see it running down to the mill here and would have brought the coal in and no doubt taken uh, probably brought the grain in and taken some of the flour out so the effect was of course that industry could be pretty well anywhere and um, water power on the scale available from small rivers didn't matter anymore so at first in the process of industrialization in England the river's important it's an early river to get industrialized in England although not on a European sort of level of things not in that area that stretches from northern Italy to southern England, I suppose, including the Low Countries. Um, but then, of course, the development of technology, steam, and of course, later electricity, makes industry footloose. And the river becomes a bit of an irrelevance, really, from the manufacturing point of view. So that's the Wandle in the Industrial Revolution. And thank you for listening.